I think I heard the bell. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Diana Sharp. Welcome to First Baptist Church of Cornelius. I have been absent for a couple weeks. I apologize for that, but I don't because I had to take a vacation. Um, in the back of the pew pockets are the Baptist Faith and Message. If you'd like to take one of those, you're welcome to. If you're a visitor, we have visitor cards in the back of the uh, pew pockets also. Excuse me, I'm a little winded. If you would fill those out, if you're a visitor, and place them in the um, offering plate in the back on your way out, uh, share as much information as you'd like with us to have. Also, if you are in need of a pastor or deacon uh, visitation, please see the pastor. And if you're not sure who your deacon is, make sure you see the pastor, and he will make sure you know. But you guys should know who your deacon is. In the bulletin, it says that... Um, the Bible studies are canceled this week. It's only the 630, and that is through July, and we start back in August. But the 2 o'clock will still happen. Um, and that also affects choir practice. So I'll go ahead and mention that. So choir practice is at 630 now. So you have no excuse about driving in the dark or whatever. Just come on and practice. We'll have a good time. There's still um, a big need for Bible school. If you would like to help with that, see David. Also, there is a meeting today for planning. If you just want to come and hear what's going on and see if you'd like to be involved, that would be awesome. But there is a job for everyone. So our prayer, our prayer warriors meet at 10 o'clock on Tuesday. 7 o'clock is the men's prayer breakfast. You bring your own breakfast. Coffee is provided. We already talked about the 2 o'clock and the 6.30 Bible studies and the, and the singing. Oh, we need the blood. Anybody that would like to donate, we're having a blood drive here on the 21st. If you'd like to help, I'm going to come and help hand out, hand out cookies. I'm not a candidate to give blood, but I think it's a good thing. I'm going to tell you something. Back in 16 and 17, I was so sick, and I was in the hospital almost every month in 2017 and I got at least two units of blood. I think there was one time I got three and I was so thankful for people that that donated. It is such a life-saving thing. So that's just a little testimony from me. So if you can come out, um, if you need more information, you can see Roberta. She's right there. I think that is all the announcements. 
Does anybody got anything else? Okay. Michelle. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How's it? And there he was. How's everybody doing this morning? It is so good to see everybody here on this beautiful Lord's Day. The sun is out today. And you know what? It, it wouldn't matter if it was pouring the rain or if the sun is out. It's still a beautiful Lord's Day. Whether or not it's Wednesday or Sunday, it's still a beautiful day that the Lord has made. One of my favorite Bible verses, probably my favorite of all, is Luke 1, 37. Does anybody know what that is? For with God, nothing shall be impossible. To me, that tells me just how strong God is, how mighty he is, and that there's nothing that he can't do. I heard that on the radio this morning. They were talking about uh, saying a double negative, and they said, but that's probably the best way to describe it is using a double negative. But God is powerful. He's strong. He's mighty. We're going to sing a couple of courses about that this morning. The first one is what a mighty God we serve, and he is mighty. And we're going to sing through that a couple of times. Then we're going to do great and mighty a couple of times. So let's stand. Join our voices together and sing out this morning. Facebook, and if you have any uh, concerns, please put them in the chat box. Let us know that you're there, and uh, we will get back to you. So, beautiful summer day today, <laughs> um, and just a little too hot. I'm just waiting for September. I think September, October. Yeah, I think that's more or less our speed here. Um, I'm here, obviously, to do the prayers and the praises. Uh, I do have a praise for Jean McKinney, who had to have a pacemaker uh, implanted uh, after his other surgery didn't do the trick. So that went well. So we praise God for that, for Jean. Um, Lois... I believe it's not feeling good today, and 
were waiting to hear Fred, her husband. They went up for consultation um, on the 14th to see what steps they're going to take for Fred's uh, new cancer in his throat and haven't heard. So let's keep those two in our prayers um, also. Um, continue to pray for Priscilla and her family on the loss of her mom. Um, we love them so. And just this whole church, just pray for one another. Uh, we're all one unit here, and we all need one another, and we all do better with one another. So when you're doing your prayers, please include everybody in this church. Um, do I have any prayers or praises? Yes, Diana. Yeah, mm hmm Uh, she, she, okay, she lost, that was her mom, right? Okay. Welcome back, by the way. We missed you. <laughs> Amen. Anyone else? Hi. Welcome, welcome. What is your name? Andrew. And what's your name? Oh, I'm sorry. Alex? Alexander. Alexandra. Okay, I'll get it on the third try. <laughs> oh, hope you feel better. Well, good for you, and we're, we're glad to have you, Anne. We support what you do. So, we'll be praying for you. Um, I also have a prayer for a friend of mine. Um, her husband had uh, foot surgery, had diabetes, and uh, something went wrong, and uh, back in the hospital with infections, out of the hospital. Now he just, yesterday, I was uh, there, and he fell in the shower. So um, things aren't going well. Her, his name is George. And uh, his wife is Deanne, she's his nurse, so to speak, and they're like 92 years old. And they're wonderful people, and uh, I asked for prayers for them. Somebody else had a prayer? Fine. They, they got COVID, so they, they oh. seem to be pulling out of it, but... Uh, but uh, on the plus side, uh, she's expecting a new great, uh, a new grandson. Okay. We're going to have another great grandson. So. Great grandson. Yeah. Uh, yes. I am thankful that we had a 14-day, 3,000-mile um, trip that was an endurance test, but we got to oh. see all sides of the family, lots oh, of friends, great. a class reunion. We would just on the run constantly. Well, we missed you. But it was the thank you. But it was yeah. really, really a blessing. Good, good. Yep. Good. good safe travels and, and safe travels and all that family to get to oh, see yeah. and memories. Yeah, exactly. Memories, exactly. Uh, one other, I, I saw Wayne uh, Ballon outside Carol's uh, 
having problems and, and just ongoing. And, and just if we could just pray for strength and healing and comfort for uh, Carol. I ask if there's any unspoken, unspoken <laughs> prayers. <laughs> and I think we all we all have some unspoken <laughs> prayers. <clears throat> Let us go to the Father. Father, we come before you and realize what a privilege this is. That we can come to your throne and you will hear our prayers and care. For you made that possible through your Son, Jesus. We come to you through your Son. We ask that you hear these names, these circumstances, these situations, and hear our pleas for help, comfort, strength, whether it be physical strength, mental strength, spiritual strength. All these people are important to us as they are to you. We ask that you show us ways that we can help and be a help, be a solution, not a problem. Father, we thank you for this building and the freedom we have to come and honor you. We ask for prayers for our vacation Bible school coming up that we serve you well and the, and the blood drive coming up this Thursday that we can serve others all these things we ask in your son's precious name Amen. Amen you know there was a lot of things mentioned that was praise reports and it's worthy to give or he's worthy for us to give him the praise and the honor and the glory for that. And the Bible tells us to give him the praise, to sing out to him. And it doesn't matter if it's a mountaintop experience or you're down in the valley, we still should be singing our praises to God. Because the Bible says in all things to give thanks. And I think part of giving thanks is singing to him. So let's stand this morning once again, and we're going to sing hymn number 499, I Will Sing the Wondrous Story. Let's join together.
at this time of the offertory prayer, uh, I'd like to remind you that we no longer pass the, pass the plate, but uh, the collection plates are in the back and in the front here if you'd like to leave your tithes and offering on the way in or on the way out. Uh, for those of you who are watching at home on Facebook Live, you can send your tithes and offering to P.O. Box 100, Cornelius, North Carolina, 28031. Or you can go to the website, firstbaptistchurchofcornelius.org, and use the donate page. Either way, we thank you, and we thank all of you for continuing to support the church and its mission here in uh, Cornelius. Join me in prayer now, if you would. Heavenly Father, we come to you always with praise and glory, uh, giving thanks for everything that you are doing for us and in us and through us. And Father God, I just pray that you would take these tithes and offerings that are collected here today and throughout the churches in the world and use them for your glory. Lord God, multiply them as you multiplied the fishes and the loaves so that we might do wonderful things in your name and bring glory to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, in whom we pray. Amen.
Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 15, verses 1 through 9. If you are able, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Again, this is the Gospel according to Matthew, verse 15, excuse me, chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. Then Jesus was approached by Pharisees and scribes from Jerusalem who asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, Why do you break God's commandment because of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must be put to death. But you say, Whoever tells his father or mother whatever benefit you might have received from me is a gift committed to the temple, He does not have to honor his father. In this way, you have nullified the word of God because of your tradition. Hypocrites, Isaiah prophesied correctly about you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines human commands. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. So most of you know that before I became a pastor, I had a 30-year career in the health insurance industry, and one of the things that I did was to teach continuing education for health insurance agents. And I was working for United Health Group at the time, and you probably know United Health Group, big organization, and they would put together these continuing education classes and then they would train us in them, and then we would give them to the insurance agents. Well, we had this one class, which was on healthcare ethics, and the first slide in the presentation uh, talked about what is ethics, its principles of morality, and that sort of thing. Then the second slide said, where does ethics come from? And the answer all was in the negative. Well, it doesn't come from religion. It doesn't come from the law. It doesn't come from social norms. And it doesn't come from here, there, or the other place. And then the rest of the presentation goes on. And when the instructor was done, he asked if there were any questions. And so I raised my hand and I said, yeah, I have a question. I said, you never addressed the second slide. Where do ethics come from? I said, you told us where they don't come from, but where does ethics come from? Well, he kind of dodged the question and went back to the slide and pointed out what the slide said. And I said, yes, I understand. It doesn't come from here. It doesn't come from there. But where does ethics come from? You see, at the time, I was in seminary, and I was pressing him for an answer. And the answer I was looking for is God or the Bible or even if he said a personal higher power, something to acknowledge God. But he wouldn't do it. And so he continued to dodge the question. I continued to press. And eventually he got frustrated and he said, ethics are determined by the board of directors of United Health Group. And I had a similar reaction, but actually I didn't. I just said, thank you very much. And I I was done. (laughs) But that's the way the world thinks. The world thinks that the word of man is greater than the word of God. And in this case, this individual who was trying to teach ethics had no grounding in where ethics came from. It was arbitrary. In his case, he felt it was best by the board of directors of United Health Group. And so when I would teach that class, I would point out to the students, I would say the most important thing that you will walk away with today is a decision in your mind. What is the standard by which you will determine morality and your ethics? What is right? What is wrong? What is true? What is false? What is moral and what is immoral? And of course, for me, and I pray for you, the Word of God the Bible is that supreme authority. And no word of man can supersede it. And therefore, we must always obey the word of God over the word of man. And I believe that's the point of this passage today. 
Because the passage today starts out with the word of man. Verses 1 and 2 says, Jesus was approached by the Pharisees and scribes from Jerusalem. Now, if he is still in Gennesaret, from the reading from last week, or even if he's back in Capernaum, it's a good distance from Jerusalem. So the scribes and the Pharisees have traveled all the way to Jerusalem to see Jesus, because obviously they've heard about him, and they've come to investigate him, and they've probably more so have come to discredit him, because he is going to become a problem for them. And in order to discredit him as a teacher, they pick on the disciples and say, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat. Now, this idea of washing hands, this is not a hygiene issue. All right? This is a ceremonial issue. All right? It's a ritual hand washing that they traditionally did before they ate. And the disciples are breaking the tradition as it says here. That word is more literally translated as they pass it by or they ignore it. They're just not doing it. They're just deciding that we're not going to do this ritual hand washing before we eat. And this word tradition, when you look at it in Hebrew, is more literally something that is handed down from generation to generation by word of mouth. And that might not sound important, but it's very important. Because the law of God has been written down. This is just the verbal word of man. But, even though it is not written law, in the minds of the Pharisees and the scribes, it has become the force of law. And so before we move on, I do want to talk about traditions and how they play a role in society. They play a role in your family. They play a role in the church. And many of these traditions are handed down from generation to generation. And there's comfort in tradition. There's assurance. There's consistency. There's a good feeling about tradition. And tradition in and of itself is not bad. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11.2 and 2 Thessalonians 2.15 to hold on to the traditions that they've been taught. So this is not a condemnation of tradition. But tradition can become a problem if it is elevated to the position of authority. And that's where it is. You'll hear in the church, this is the way we've always done it. It's tradition. But that tradition can't overrule scripture. It can't overrule our governing documents. It is just tradition. And likewise, tradition, which is an invention of man, can never overrule the word of God. And so, to begin, think about the traditions that you have in your family. Traditions that we have here in the church. What are the things that we do time and time again? And then are any of those traditions things that might be contrary to the word of God? Because if they are, then they need to be put in their proper place. And this is the issue today. The tradition of the elders has become elevated to the point that is superseding the word of God. And in essence, the word of man has become superior to the word of God. And so Jesus addresses this. And he doesn't answer the question. When they said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? He doesn't give an answer. He just ignores the question, and probably because he doesn't see it as important. It's a tradition of the elders. I'm going to get to you what is really important. And Jesus confronts the Pharisees and scribes for their ignoring God's word. He says, why do you break God's commandment because of your tradition? Right? You are criticizing the disciples for breaking the tradition. I'm going to point out that you are breaking God's law, which is much worse. Now, he quotes scripture, which is hugely important. When you're having this sort of a conversation with someone, you want to establish the proper authority, and Scripture is that authority. And he starts out, and don't miss this, in verse 4. Jesus says, For God said. That's the authority. It's not Jesus' opinion. 
It's not Jesus versus the Pharisees. This is God's word versus the Pharisees. God said, honor your father and mother. Whoever speaks evil of the father or mother must be put to death. And then in verse 5 it starts as, but you say, catch that. Verse 4, God said, verse 5, but you say. Who is the real authority here? Of course it is God. But you say, whoever tells his father or mother, whatever benefit you might have received from me is a gift committed to the temple. So Jesus is pointing out to them that God's word, Exodus 21.17 and Leviticus 29, are in conflict with what the tradition of the elders are. And the Pharisees' argument is based in their authority. Jesus' argument is based in the word of God. And he goes on to say, what do you say, Pharisees? You say that a person can justify not caring for their parents if they instead decide to dedicate whatever support they would have given to them to the temple instead. It's like us saying to our parents, I'd like to help you pay your bills, pay your medicine, but the money that I have, I'm going to give it to the church instead. Okay? That's just not right. Jesus says by doing this, the Pharisees are allowing, even encouraging the people to justify ignoring the needs of their parents to whom they owe honor and thus breaking the law. And the specifics of the argument isn't really the issue here. This is an issue of authority. God's word or man's word. Which one is the true authority? God's word says one thing. Man's word says another. Only one can be right. Now in the church today, when I say the church, I mean the church universal. This is easily illustrated in the issue of same-sex marriage. The scripture is clear that homosexuality, along with other sexual immorality, is sin, and thus same-sex marriage is prohibited. Yet the word of man wants to proclaim this as good, wants to proclaim it as acceptable, that this is indisputable, and as of today, it's constitutional. But even the Supreme Court has no authority to say something is permissible if God's word says it is not. Yet many churches and denominations have adopted the word of man as being superior to the word of God and have moved forward in accepting this issue. And so for us individually and collectively, we must be knowledgeable of God's word. Otherwise, how will we know what God's word says unless we study it? So think about it. How knowledgeable are you of God's Word? And if you don't feel as knowledgeable as you possibly could be, what is available to you to help you become more uh, knowledgeable of God's Word? Well, certainly owning a Bible is the first step. All right, Having your own personal Bible. If you don't have a Bible, come see me after the service and you will leave this building with a Bible. Okay? If you have the Bible, then get into reading it. Read whatever. It's all God's Word. Start somewhere and then seek assistance. Remember what the, the, the uh, eunuch said to... Um, uh, I just lost Philip. Thank you so much. Just lost my place. Um, he said, how can I understand it unless someone explains it to me? All right. And so consequently, come to Bible study. Come to church. Hear the Word exposed. And continue to study the Bible. Because in the end, we need to make a choice. We need to make a choice between the word of man or the word of God. And that brings us to the main point of today's reading. The supremacy of God's word. Jesus continues and says in verse 6, He does not have to honor his father. In this way, you have no... The tradition of the Pharisees is in direct opposition to the Word of God. It is nullified, voided, canceled out, made of no effect. Different translations say different things. They all mean the same. 
that they have set God's word aside and replaced it with the word of man. And for this, Jesus calls them out as hypocrites. Verse 7, hypocrites! Isaiah prophesies correctly about you. Here in criticizing um, the Pharisees, Jesus goes straight back to Scripture again. He quotes Isaiah 29, 13. This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrine human commands. Essentially, they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. They teach as doctrine the commandments of men. They should be teaching as doctrine the word of God. And Jesus is making clear that the word of God is superior to the word of man. Now the Jews would have known this at the time. Remember, Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. And Isaiah 29 continues on beyond what Jesus has quoted, or at least what Matthew has recorded. And it goes on to say that because they are honoring God with their lips, but their heart is far away, and because they are worshiping in vain and teaching doctrines that are as human commands, because of this, it says, God will confound or astonish those who think they are wise, and their so-called wisdom will perish, and those who think they are so intelligent will be shown to be fools. And then it goes on to say that the people have turned the relationship with God upside down, calling the clay the potter and the potter the clay. In essence, we are God and you are not, is what they're saying. Our opinion is superior to the word of God. And Jesus is making the point, the world is not turned upside down when the word of God is superior. And it doesn't matter what the question or the issue is. The Word of God is always the authority for our faith and life. And it's clear. Don't fall for this idea that there's multiple views. Man will twist the Scripture to mean what he wants it to mean because he wants to have authority over God's Word. But instead, God's Word should be the authority over man. The potter is greater than the clay. The Bible is authoritative. It is inerrant. It is infallible. It is sufficient. It is eternal. It's universal. The Word of God is supreme and should be in our lives. And so I'll ask you the same question I asked folks during those CE classes. What is the ultimate authority in your life? What is the standard by which you decide what is right and wrong? What is true and false? What is moral or immoral? If it's not the word of God, then what is it? Joshua famously said in Joshua 24, 15, Choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose this day whom you will serve. Will you choose to follow the word of God, or will you choose to follow the word of man? And all God's people said, Amen. <clears throat> the most important thing the word of God tells us is how to renew the relationship with God. And you all have heard me say this many times, but I'll say it again until I'm dead, I pray. And that might sound funny, but it's true. All right? If the gospel is the last thing that leaves my lips, then praise be to God. All right? I want to enter heaven and hear God say, well done, good and faithful servant. And I wouldn't be a good and faithful servant if we didn't have the invitation every Sunday. If we didn't have what people call the altar call every Sunday. Because heaven forbid any person walk out of this building without the opportunity to give their life to Christ. And so it's very simple. You were created to be in a relationship with God. But you broke that relationship through your disobedience to God, which is called your sin. And we've all done it, myself included. 
There's nothing you can do to fix that relationship on your own. And see, I was fooled by that for years and years. I thought I was saved. I thought I was doing all the right things to make God happy with me. But everything I did thinking I was drawing myself closer to God was actually pushing myself further away. Because I can't build the bridge to Him, only He can build the bridge to me. And that's why He sent His Son Jesus to live the life that I should have lived and to die the death that I deserve to die. And then He rose again on the third day so that if we would just believe in Him by faith, we too will rise with Him. And so that's it. That's the choice. To follow the Word of God or follow the Word of man. Man will tell you you're good enough. I'm here to tell you you're not. And actually, I'm not here to tell you you're not. The Word of God is here to tell you you're not good enough. But Jesus made the way. He will take away your sin. And then you will have eternal life in His name. So today, as David now plays, and hopefully you all will sing, if anyone out there has never given your life to Christ, I beg you to do so today. We lost a couple of people over the past couple of weeks. No one of us never know when our time will come. You know, I joked a minute ago that, you know, if, if I die with the gospel on my uh, last breath, then praise God, I could drop dead here. Who knows? Who knows? Give your life to Christ today. We're going to sing page 591, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. David, in his message, talked about how we've gotten things backwards. We think that we're the potter instead of the clay. There's a line in this song that says, Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. Another verse says, Fill with thy spirit till all shall see. Christ only always living in me. Let's stand and join our hearts and sing this song and remember what Pastor David has told us this morning. Just a quick reminder that we'll have the VBS meeting uh, immediately following the service. So if you're interested in hearing about the Vacation Bible School or participating in the Bible School, then please meet in the Fellowship Hall when we're done here on or about 12, 12, 15. Heavenly Father, we come to you once again with praise and thanksgiving for your holy word. And Father God, let us lift up your word on high. Father God, bring low the word of man. 
And let us all go forward to study your word, to know it better, that we might live our lives faithfully and worship you truly in your word. Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.